part of what we call Wonderful Wednesdays, the time to send yourself and the center of the week. We invite you to come in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This is Wednesday's Word of Trinity USC. Today we're going to be looking at how we can persevere during trials, like this COVID trial. In this biblical perspective from James, we're going to see why we have trials, what is God's purpose in them, and how we can get through them. We are going to learn that through it all, through it all, we need to trust in Jesus, and we need to trust in God's Word. So as we come this morning, we invite you to join us. Grab your Bibles. We're going to be looking at James 1, 1 through 12. We're going to be singing some awesome songs about looking to Jesus, turning our sorrows over to God, allowing us to walk in faith in those places. So we invite you, we invite you to come join us. We also invite you to click on the link so we know you're here so we can begin. We invite you to give us a smiley face or a heart or something. And if you have a prayer request today, we invite you to call Christina or uh, text me or send an email to trishariggs at gmail.com because we've been praying for you. Uh, we want you to know that we're looking forward to the time when we can get together and pray with you, not just for you. And so we're inviting you to come be with us today. So our, uh, our starting song is going to be Trade My Sorrows. It's one you might have done before. It's one that talks about looking at the difference uh, between uh, keeping your sorrows and allowing them to not give you joy. And so that's one of the main lines that is in James. Is it's talking about trading our, our, our sorrows and our trials and tribulations for the joy of the Lord. That's where we're going to start today. Trade my sorrows.
a purpose. Is it possible that trials really can have a purpose and a meaning? Is it possible that this is something that's good for us? None of us would like to think so. But I think we're going to find out as we read James that trials do have a purpose. And they bring us to a better place. I invite you to open your scriptures today as we read James 1, 1 through 12. James, a servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes scattered among the nations. Consider it for pure joy, my beloved, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God, who gives graciously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to him. But when he asks, he must believe and not doubt, because he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That man should not think he will receive anything from the Lord. He is double-minded man, unstable in all he does. The brother is humble circumstances, ought to take pride in his high position. But the one who is rich should take pride in his low position, because he will pass away like a wild flower. For the sun rises with scorching heat and withers. The plant, its blossoms fall, and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich man will fade away even when he goes about his business. And then verse 12, blessed is the man who perseveres under trials because he has stood the test. He will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Bubba, I know you're in the sound effect there, and when you turned me up, it created an echo. Could you turn that back down, please? So as we begin, I want to begin with prayer. Thank you. Father God, we just ask that you would illuminate this word by the power of your Holy Spirit. And as we do that, we ask that you would allow us to understand what does it mean that we have trials for a purpose. Help us to see where we are in this place of what we call COVID-19, uh, this coronavirus. We pray, Father, for protection over our nation and protection over our neighbors and our friends. And we ask, Lord, that you would help us to be wise, like the word says, that we might walk in your ways and that we might be protected because of you. And if we do have to face the trial that we're facing today, that you would give us courage to face it and that you would be with us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. And all the people say, Amen. Well, today I'm going to share a little bit about the scripture. I'm going to begin with verse 1, and I'm going to go down to verse 4, and then I'm going to skip all the way to verse 12, because that's what it's all about to be those who understand trials with a purpose. I want to begin with a, a little understanding of what is trial, what is it all about, and, and, and how come Christians sometimes struggle. I think the best understanding comes from Dean Trier in his um, teaching on storms of life. It states that most people don't know how to handle trials or storms of life because most people, including many Christians, don't have a personal and deep relationship with Jesus Christ. And since they don't, they don't understand why these storms and tribulations and trials are in their lives. Is that true for you? Do you question why when a trial or tribulation comes in your life, when you find yourself caught in a storm, is the first thing you ask is, why me? Or why am I here? What, what did it, I do to deserve this storm? I know I've been there sometimes. What did I do to deserve this? But as I've grown a little bit stronger in my faith, I've come to realize that it's not why me, but what do you want me to do with this God? How do you want me to understand this God? Dean Courier once again says he gives us great insight when he asks a very blunt question about the time the disciples are in the middle of the Sea of Galilee in the storm. He says, how did the disciples get in the middle of the Sea of Galilee in that storm? They were in the middle of the violent storm, but it was not because they had sinned. But if you think about it, it was because they followed Jesus. 
I hate to be the bearer of bad news, beloved, but here's a not-so-secret bit of information. If you set your heart and mind on following Jesus, the storms of life will arise, and there's mainly two reasons why that happens. The first is the devil doesn't like it when you follow Jesus. Why? Because when you follow Jesus, you're not following the world. And who is ruler over the world? Satan. Because when you start to follow Jesus, he gets upset. And when you uh, upset him, he's going to try to destroy anything you're doing. He's going to stand in your way. He's going to try to make things miserable. He's going to um, influence demonic things around you. He's going to make people get all upset. People are going to gossip about you or people are going to provoke fights with you. And it's going to get you all confused and upset. Now, why would Satan do that? Think about that for a minute. Why would he do that? I think the reason why he does it is because he doesn't want you focusing on God. He might even afflict one of your family members with an illness. I know, I've been there, done that, got the t-shirt, it was not fun. And if he gets you in that way, he can keep you in a place where you're questioning God. God, God, what are you, why are you doing this? And he might even get to the place where you question your faith. So I think that's the first reason why uh, we get in these places and, and we begin to understand that trials are hard for us, but we also need to focus that on God. And so here is the second reason why we see that storms will arise. And I think it's because, are you ready for this? God allows them to. He doesn't cause them, but he allows them. And I want you to think of the story of Job. Think about Job. God allowed that to happen. Why would God do that and keep and not keep us from the trials of life? I think it's because God wants to develop us, mature our faith, and get us to understand that we need him, that we can't live life by ourselves, that we have to walk with him hand in hand. And, of course, the best way we come to realize that is how. First-hand experience through those trials. It makes sense if you think about someone who is maybe trying to win a prize or exercise or, or do a marathon. The physics of exercise are the only way that you can get stronger is to do what? Exercise. So the same is true in our spiritual life. If our faith is not exercised, we don't get stronger. As a matter of fact, we get flabby in our faith and we become lethargic in our relationship with God. So I think that's why God allows, not causes, but allows storms in our lives so God can actively demonstrate his faithfulness to us so he can build us up in our faith and so we can learn to trust him. This is what James is talking about today in his epistles. He says, as he says, we should consider it pure joy, pure joy when we face trials of many kinds. Our scripture begins today with an introduction from James, the brother of Jesus. He says in verse 1, James, a bondservant or a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greetings. By this time, James was a prominent leader in the Jerusalem church and a member of the Jerusalem council. James was the half-brother of Jesus which makes his self-introduction even more significant. James could have pulled rank and said, Hey, I grew up with Jesus. I knew him before he was famous. I am James, the son of the Virgin Mary, brother of Jesus Christ. But no, he doesn't do that. Instead, he and you both open their letters by calling themselves bond servants or servants, those who are slaves to a property master. What they're doing in that is they're calling Jesus their master, Jesus their Lord. Now, James wrote his letter to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations. You need to understand the history and the persecution of the Jews. That goes clear back to what we call the diaspora. Okay, the diaspora was back when Assyria came in and took the northern kingdom, the Babylonian came in and they took the southern kingdom. And when they did that, they dispersed the Jews all over. But more recently, in this persecution, he's specifically talking about the Roman Empire 
and the non-converted Jews. There was conflict between the Jews who had converted to Christianity, the Judeo-Christian, and those who said, no, that's wrong, that did not accept Jesus as their savior. And it's in this conflict and in this tension that James is writing a letter to encourage the Jewish Christian believers to stand firm in their times of trial. They were to do that so that they could persevere and be better on the other side. I think this is appropriate for us during these COVID times so we can be better on the other side. Then in verse 2, read with me there, it says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, my beloved, my Aldelphio, which here is believers, both men and women, who are part of the family of God. You see, James knew that believers, these believers that he loved, that were part of his family, would have to face trials in their Christian life. And he felt that at the same time, these trials were an occasion for joy, not discouraged resignation, not say, oh, what am I going to do in fear and suffering? As a matter of fact, the word he uses here is chera. Chera. It even sounds joyful, doesn't it? It is a Greek noun that means an inner gladness, a delight, a rejoicing. Now, in the New Testament, it is a significant feeling of happiness that's based on our spiritual reality, independent of what's happening in the world. Joy is not an experience that comes from favorable circumstances, because you got your best piece of candy, or because you got your fuzzy slippers that you wanted. No, it is a gift from God from God to believers, it is a part of our very essence. It's a manifestation, really, and a gift of the Holy Spirit. Joy is a deep down sense of well-being when we know that our heart abides in the Lord Jesus Christ. You know the song. I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Where? Down in my heart. You see, James knew that if our heart was focused on God, and we were to oh, we would come to places of trials, but they were merely tests of faith, that we had God in our heart. And because of that, we could prove that God was faithful and that we too would produce a witnessing faith of patience and perseverance. Let me say that word again, perseverance. In the continuation of verse 2, it says, Whenever you face trials of many kinds, now, the word for trial here is an important word. It's purasmos, P-E-I-R-A-S-M-O-S, purasmos. It kind of sounds like a rash, right? Purasmos. And it's, it's what is not necessarily known as a temptation, although it's translated that way in some scriptures. But what it means is not a fleshly seduction that causes us to sin, but a test that causes us to be called into our faith cause us to emerge even stronger and purer in our faith. Some examples of this in the scriptures are a young bird, for example, testing his wings so he can learn to fly, the wings in the mother's nest. When God tested Abraham, for example, Abraham demanding the sacrifice of Isaac, or when Israel went into the promised land and God did not remove the people that were there, he made them be tested Purizan, so that they would see if they were faithful, if they would be true to God. As I said before, the Christian faith is like an athlete in training. The heavier the training course, the more they undergo, the stronger they will become. And the more they will be glad that when they complete the race, that they win the victory. Browning says it this way, we must welcome each rebuff that turns earth's smoothness into rough. For every hard thing is just another step upward and onward to eternity's goal. Now, all kinds of experience come, come to us as we are on this earth. There will be tests of sorrows and disappointments that will seek to take our faith away. There will be tests of seductions which seek to lure us from walking in the right path with God. There will be tests of dangers or sacrifices that we're called to make or the unpopularity of being a Christian through your family or through friends. And we will be half-defaced with that. But they're not met 
meant, let's see if I can say that word, they're not meant to make us fall. They're meant to make us soar. They're not meant to defeat us. They are meant for us to defeat them. They are not meant to make us weaker. They are meant to make us stronger. Therefore, we should not bemoan them. We should rejoice and see them as a test of God so that we can become stronger. Now, James describes this processing or this testing as a refinement. He uses the word dohimian, dohimian. It's a word that is used for sterling coinage or for purifying money, purifying gold, refining it, making it pure or genuine. As he says, consider it pure joy. Now, the aim of testing is to purge out all the impurities so your faith will be as pure as gold. I've been so impressed as I've watched the congregation during this time stepping up to the plate, playing music, doing things that they have never done before, stepping beyond their comfort zones, making masks, making gifts for the nursing home, giving donations to the food pantry, doing things that have showed that they're getting stronger and stronger, and they're not discouraged. It seems as if they're persevering in their faith and they're proving it through the fruit that they're bearing. And why are they doing that? Because in verse 3 it says, because they know that the testing of their faith produces the gift of perseverance. That's what verse 3 says. Now the reason that trials are to be considered grounds for joy is because they develop in us a characteristic of perseverance. James believes that in these times of trial, if they're met in the right way, they can produce in us a steadfast faith, a stick to itness, a tenacity that proves our faith genuine. I think you can really tell the faith of a person in the midst of a trial. If they're falling all apart, there's something going on in there. They're not being faithful to God. But if they're standing steadfast, even if they lose a loved one like I saw yesterday, and they know that Jesus is there with them, then they know that the storm where they are standing will one day be over, and they one day will see Jesus face to face. They know that that spiritual stamina to stand is one that once the storm is through, they're still going to be standing. So, beloved, where are you in the storm? Are you still going to be standing? Will you be the same person, or will you find yourself stronger because of what you've been through? Will you have a greater faith? The word James uses here is hapomoni. Hapomoni. And it is sometimes translated as patience. But that's not a good enough translation because it is a word that talks about the ability to endure and to bear things. The ability to turn them into a greater glory. Like turning lemon into lemonade. Or to take the adversity and find a seed of equal or greater benefit and plant it in your life and watch it grow for God's glory. I've seen that happen many times in the lives of people as they have had an episode happen with them, maybe a loss of a loved one, and then they become a grief counselor. And it's in these places that we begin to see that these trials are used for God's purposes. It's not too unlike the testimony of the great martyrs. The thing that amazed the heathens that often were persecuting them and killing them was the joy, the singing that the martyrs would have in the midst of their dying. There's a wonderful testimony about one of the saints that died as he was burning on the cross. He had a big smile on his face. And one of the people in the crowd says, why are you smiling, you fool? And he said, because I see the glory of the Lord and I'm going home to meet him. This is the kind of persistent faith, strong faith, that a Christian is able to have in the midst of suffering. Because they can see ahead. They know if they persevere that they will one day be made complete and the, the finisher of their work on earth will complete his task in them and they will meet Jesus. I think that's why in James 4 it says, Therefore, we will let perseverance finish its work so that we may be mature and complete, not lacking in anything. The effect of testing develops in us not only strength to bear more, but 
an ability to face and conquer even harder battles. Is your faith stronger today than it was when you began saying, Jesus loves me? I mean, think about that. It is an unswerving consistency and perseverance in the end that makes believers understanding three things. I think the first, it not only perfects them, and that word is telos. It gives us that perfection. Now, telos can be used to be fully grown. But in the spiritual sense, it's talking about full maturity in Jesus Christ. That we're fit for the task that God has sent us into this world to experience. And the second gift that it gives us is what we call complete. The Greek word here is holokateros. Holokateros, which means perfected in every way. Not having a uh, blemish or any type of foul thing in mind, body, soul, or spirit. It is a completion of a gradual process that removes the weakness and the imperfection of our character. It's courage. It's building up a courage. It is, is understanding that we will gain this courage and become complete and gain the virtue that allows us to be entirely fit for God's service and for service for our fellow man. Now, Wesley calls this what we call the process of Christian perfection. In the teaching, it describes a, a spiritual maturity or a going towards a perfected state. The ultimate goal of this process is complete union with God, a pure love of God, as well as a personal holiness and sanctification. And the third thing that happens as we stand that test is that we find out that we become deficient in nothing. If a believer meets his test in the right way, if he develops that day-by-day day unswerving consistency, he will have a victorious life, and he will be raised up to the standard of Jesus Christ. You know, in the scripture it says we're supposed to become more like Jesus every day. And I think in the midst of trials, as we ask those questions, what will Jesus do in this? What do you want me to do, God, in this midst? Then we begin to see what God has us in that place and how he is developing us to be stronger and to be more like Jesus. As we come to those places and face those trials, it develops a spiritual maturity. It helps develop a balance of all the graces. It develops a character in us that allows us to be sure in our Christian life. Now, I want to skip to verse 12. And you say, why are you skipping over all that other good stuff? Because we got time. Yeah, there we go. All right, so I want to skip to verse 12 because really, in essence, that's the completion of this teaching on trials with a purpose. Verse 12 says, blessed is the one who perseveres under trials because having stood the test, that person receives the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love them. So you see, if we persevere, not only as our character developed, we get some good stuff. We get to be blessed, and we get the promise of the crown of life. So that blessed word is merakeos, merakeos, which describes a transcendent happiness. One that is the, the life beyond a life of care, labor, and death. It is those who know, blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Only a foretaste of glory divine. They know the distinctive joy that comes from the benefits of salvation. And because of that, they're blessed. Beloved, do you know the assurance and joy of Jesus? If you found out today that you were going to die tomorrow, would you be like that saint that was burning in the fire, smiling a big grin because you knew where you were going? Secondly, James says that if we persevere, we will receive the Stephanos, or the crown of life. In the ancient world, people were crowned in many different places. One place was at a wedding. They, or festivals, they would wear crowns of flowers on their head. You've probably seen that at a wedding before. They also would wear crowns that marked royalty. royalty. It was the, worn by the kings or those in authority. And during the Olympic Games, the winners would receive a wreath or laurel, oak or even celery, believe it or not, yes. And it marked a honor or a dignity for them winning the race or whatever Olympic event they were in. But this text puts that crown in a different view. 
And it's one that's given to the believer if they're victorious through the struggle of the trials. But hear how it relates to the trials of that day and to the crowns of that day. When they are a Christian and they have joy because they have no other, it's because they have been crowned with the crown as the inheritance of the child of God. They're also one day going to be part of the wedding feast with the bridegroom. And on that day, they will receive a crown that shows that they have finished the race and they won the prize, that place in glory. It, it is a reward for those who have proven their faith in Christ. This crown is a new kind of living, which is life indeed. It is a life that allows us to know that Jesus is in the here and now and in the heavenly after. So in closing, I want to ask you a few questions. When life doesn't go your way, what's your response? Do you throw in the towel of faith and go on your own way? Or do you persevere and trust in God's wisdom? Do you have a longer view in mind in this life? One that outlasts this world? You know, this world is not your home. You're only passing through. And when you pass through, will you be wearing the crown of life? Beloved James says it is that, the, that the Christian meets the testings of life. And if they do in a steady consistency, which Christ can give to them, they will definitely understand a splendor that's ever before. These trials have a purpose. They remind us that in the midst of challenges, if we are people who continue to love God, despite the pains and the problems, we will be blessed in this life indeed. So as your pastor, I invite you to persevere. Don't give up. Still wear the mask that you don't want to wear. Still put on the gloves that you don't want to. Still stay home because you don't want to stay home. I know I'm going crazy. But remain steadfast. Stand the test of time so that when we're on the other side, you will still be standing. Let's do it for his glory and for your good. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Let us pray. Oh God, we thank you so much for your provision in the midst of this time. We thank you so much that you are a God who is there to show us that we can have joy, even in the midst of trials. Papa, I ask that you would be present with all those who are going stir-crazy and help them to understand that you were there with them, that they're not alone, and that they will be standing at the end of this time, at the end of this trial, as long as they are faithful. Because we know that he who begins a good work in us will be faithful to complete it. And all the people say, Amen. I do have a few announcements for you. Uh, one that's up at the top of our list is we want to make sure that all the college grads get in touch with Christina because we want to make sure that we can celebrate. We don't know if we're going to have to do that virtually or we'll actually be back together again. We're waiting to hear the news on that one. But please, please, I invite you to get in touch with Christina so we can have the information for all your grads. Also, uh, Bible studies, don't forget those on Wednesday. There's the seedbed one and hearing God speak. You can get those links on our website, on our Facebook. And then on Thursday, we have the men's study. And they're inviting you to come join them if you'd like to grow a little bit more in the Lord. Also on the top of our list is Noah Johnstone. Noah is going to be joining us as our family, youth, and young adult pastor. He is in the process of moving. He'll be here, I think it's on the 20th. And he is looking for a room or an apartment to rent. Um, we're asking for everybody else, if you know somebody who's renting a room or somebody who knows has, has an apartment or wants to share an apartment and rent him a room, to please let us know because he's uh, looking at doing that. Um, also, keep making your masks. Uh, when we get back together, we're probably going to be wearing those masks uh, for a little while anyway until the numbers begin to drop or go to zero. And keep bringing your notes and gifts for the nursing home. We invite you to do that. I also want to ask you to continue to pray. Pray for this coronavirus eradication. Continue to pray for those who need strength in this time. 
and to pray for the Shirley Forrest family. We lost Shirley to cancer uh, this week, and we're going to be having a graveside sometime today. And I just invite you to be praying for that family. Reach out, drop cards to them, and let them know that they are loved. Beloved, that is where we are today as we turn our eyes on Jesus. We invite you to sing with us our closing song. We thank you that you are remaining steadfast. And if you, as I said, if you need prayer, give us a call. We want to pray for you. But we are looking forward to praying with you. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Would you please sing with us the closing song, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. Go forth in the name of the Father and the Son 